wisdom, prudentia, justice, justicia, temperance, temperantia, courage, fortitudo. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. Welcome to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. My name is Steve, and I'm joined this week by Dr. Nancy Sherman. Nancy is the former, former inaugural Distinguished Chair in Ethics at the U.S. Naval Academy, a Distinguished University Professor and Professor of Philosophy at Georgetown University. She is a New York Times notable author and has written several books, including After War, Healing the Moral Wounds of Our S Soldiers, Stoic Warriors, The Ancient Philosophy Behind the Military Mind, and her most recent book, if you'd like to hold it up, is Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. Thank you. Dr. Sherman, welcome to the podcast. Oh, it's so nice to be here, Steve. Thanks so much. Well, let's just start right off the bat. Um, what led you to write this book on Stoicism? Well, I, I study ancient ethics. Um, that's been my, uh, the whole of my career, just about uh, a little bit of Kant here and there. And I think I wanted to uh, correct a picture that I found out there in pretty much a, uh, a kind of monolithic view of Stoicism, uh, ancient Stoicism, uh, as only or primarily self-reliance, mm -hmm. tough grit. Um, uh, in the military, uh, midshipmen and cadets would call it uh, suck it up, embrace the suck. <laughs> <laughs> Very colorful. Um, but as I um, look at the texts, and not just Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius, which are some folks' favorites, um, but especially thinking about Seneca, uh, who I find a really colorful character, uh, an amazing writer, um, but also in Marcus, there was really a theme of uh, the social fabric, how you build social capital, you might say, using Bob Putnam's term, the um, Harvard political scientist. Um, we don't bowl alone, that's his term, not Marcus Aurelius's, but the Stoics took the Greek polis and expanded it outward to become the, the world or the cosmos. And uh, we are connected there. And so I really wanted to emphasize that theme. You might say it's an Aristotelian inflection. Okay, I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> I am an Aristotle you know, scholar, um, first and foremost, but, the, but this really is a strong theme in, in Stoicism and ancient Stoicism. And I think it's critical because if you're thinking about resilience, you're not just thinking about yourself and yourself alone or some notion of self-sufficiency. Yeah, minimize some of the impact of the world when it, impact, it, it, when it impacts you negatively. But we often, in a healthy modern stoicism, need to be able to turn to each other for support. And having worked closely with the military and as an educator, you know, you're an educator and I'm an educator. I sit in the classroom. I see people that need help that are afraid to ask often. And this is a critical aspect, I think, of being whole. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Marcus really has put it well. If you're on a battlefield and you see uh, parts or limbs, sort of a play on words there, separated one from another, that's what we make of ourselves when we uh, separate ourselves from each other. So I take that as my um, rallying call. That's um, Seneca's rallying call, embrace humanity or let us cultivate humanity. And I run with it. And that, that's what led me to, um, to write the book. Great. Um, yeah, it's like, I, I think of being a finger on a hand uh, in that, you know, we, we think we might think of ourselves as being very important. And a lot of stoic, uh, modern stoic practitioners focus on that uh, uh, self control and in the case of some uh, modern Stoics, you know, improving their business and uh, being uh, simply being resilient without expanding out to include circles of concern and and uh, other notions that that uh, are a core aspect of Stoicism. If you if you don't skip over those parts of the ancient texts, right, right, absolutely. But what is it about Stoicism that makes it so appealing to uh, the military? Well. They had 
one of their own who embraced stoicism in a real survival mode. And that's um, Jim Stockdale, Admiral James Stockdale, who I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, in his later years um, and gave talks several times in his honor. So I, I got to know him a little bit. And for him, uh, Epictetus, and in particular Epictetus's handbook, was a survival manual. He had been given it as a parting gift when he left Stanford as a graduate student. Um, uh, in you know, uh, philosophy, he had started in international relations, I think, and moved over. And he, he joked with me and said, what is a martini loving golf playing aviator need with a book like that? Right. But it, it became his Bible, wow. essentially. He memorized it in the Ticonderoga, which was his carrier mm -hmm. um, in, in uh, the Mekong Delta area. And when he took off, or when he actually was shot down from his A4, his Skyhawk, um, this fateful day around 1965, he muttered these words. Uh, this is James Bond Stockdale leaving the world of technology, entering the world of Epictetus. Five years down there, it was seven and a half, um, two and a half in leg irons mm -hmm. down the hall. Hall would be um, a, a embellished term for this, but mm -hmm. a, a fellow prisoner was John McCain. And so the Navy, Army, I'd say Air Force, Coast Guard, <laughs> um, uh, all, all, all the Marines, certainly part of the Navy, all understand this uh, ethos. In some ways they come to it earlier, you know, the idea of, of, of Marcus Aurelius writing on the shores of the Danube while conducting the military campaigns mm -hmm. in the first century, common era. That's in their heads too. So it's sort of a natural fit. They're in, they're in environments of deprivation. That is what it is to be in the military. Got to suck it up a lot. And it appealed. So when I taught this in a large intro, introductory ethics class, it was when I got to the Stoics that every, you know, the ship had arrived. We had, <laughs> <laughs> we had come in to, to our landing and it, it was their philosophy. And I think my task always has been, um, since I have a psychoanalytic training as well, I have some psychotherapy background to make it healthy. I'm not into, um, you know, uh, all the, uh, uh, I can do it on my own. I, sure. I've sat on too many suicide review boards oh boy. With, with the military at the Pentagon. I know what it's like. Um, I've been called in, um, you know, I've been to Guantanamo also looking at imprisonment from the other side. I've talked to interrogators. So, you know, uh, uh, grit on its own is not healthy. Mm -hmm. Grit connected to others is okay. And grit connected to being a good person is part of what we strive for. So that, I believe one of the later chapters is uh, developing a, a healthy modern stoicism um, where, where you go into some of this. Let's go ahead and just go down that road for a moment and talk about some of the some of the things we need to start thinking about and trying to avoid and, and bring to the surface some things that maybe we don't talk about enough uh, when stoicism is misapplied or, or, or some aspect of it is, is, is elevated over the rest at the cost of the rest and, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the problems that come from that. Um, so one, one place to begin is that uh, some of the Stoics um, uh, were not misogynistic in any way. And this in particular, Epictetus's teacher name, not a household name now, but it's a fun name to say a few times, <laughs> Musonius Rufus. Absolutely. <laughs> Musonius Rufus uh, essentially said that women are capable of virtue as are men, and they should be educated accordingly. And this is an old theme from Republic, Plato's Republic book five. So this is not new stuff. Um, so that's a, a strand of ancient stoicism to definitely hold on to, whatever the specific culture of that time. We, right. you know, we don't have to buy uh, Rome in the first century. I would hope we don't, frankly. <laughs> yeah, I've often thought about that. How do we separate the philosophy from the culture in which it was being practiced? You know, how do we, what do we leave behind and what do we keep? And, and how do we, how do we 
separate those from time to time? It's a, it's a challenge, especially as an educator. You know, we're always in the classroom. I'm a text driven person. I teach texts um, and um, you and I've interpreted them all my life in some ways from my graduate school days on. And you um, you, you make peace with the text in certain ways, right? You figure out what is worth salvaging and what's worth tossing. And um, those of us that aren't absolute strict historians, but rather interpreters, that's what we do, I think. And that's how we make texts live and breathe without mis mistranslating or any of that, but we find ways that they can speak to us. Um, and so uh, that's part of it. So one aspect is inclusiveness. A second mm -hmm. aspect of a modern healthy stoicism is that some of the real techniques that are so uh, uh, catchy these days, life hacks, you know, right. so Valley's attachment to life hacks, um, that is not just about how I conquer my fear or how I conquer my anger by thinking in advance or pre-rehearsing evils as some of the techniques go. It's also how I correct for bias or unconscious, mm -hmm. unconscious uh, um, uh, bias that I don't even know I have. Because if you think about Seneca in on anger, what he really wants us to do is to somehow push a pause button. True, he's got a very uh, strong will <laughs> there as an idea of a strong will, so highly volitional. Um, you know, maybe Augustine bought some of that. And he really wants us to insert our will so that the impressions we take in from the world, that someone offended me, that something is a life threat, that something needs my hair trigger response. Think of police brutality here. That or someone looks different for me and I'm suspicious. All of that needs on occasion to have your will inserted. That's what he calls monitor, monitor your impressions. That's Seneca. Or another word for it is um, in, uh, have watch, well, sometimes they use the word watchful, watchful attention. So this idea of putting um, a little space in between what comes in as uh, sense impressions or impressions and how we respond both in terms of having an emotional reaction and in terms of how we behave in terms of our uh, behavioral responses, all of that they think you can be, you can slow down a little bit or critique. And I think that's an amazing life hack. Imagine if we engaged a little bit in less, you know, a little bit more reflective ways of seeing the world and not so spontaneous with all the habits of, you know, of lifelong bias that we stick into our brains. That would be amazing. That's to me is one of the remarkable gifts totally ignored if you ask me in much of the commentary. <laughs> So if I have something to contribute, I really think it's that because I think we are living in perilous times. Those of us that are educators feel it, know it. And it's been a really hard year with this pandemic and more. Did, did you start this book after the pandemic started or were you in the middle of it when, uh, when the shutdown started? Where were you in the process? Because the pandemic is found throughout the text. So obviously you mentioned it uh, throughout, but. I. It, I began it in the pandemic. Okay. I serendipitously had some time off from teaching and um, it happened to be when we were quarantined. The lockdown isn't quite the right word because I never felt like I was in a prison. <laughs> <laughs> my husband and I get along very well and <laughs> I did miss my kids desperately. They live away from me. Um, but I had an amazing editor and that was really great because <laughs> we um, wrote back and forth, but it wrote itself. I think I just, um, you know, I've been teaching this stuff for a long time and I had had a seminar uh, the year before fall 2019. That was a great seminar where we went through a lot of texts mm -hmm. and these were texts I knew really, really well anyway. Um, and it kind of just gelled. So yeah, time off the support of a very um, benevolent university and no distraction, no, no airplane to get on. <laughs> well, let's talk about that, like 
the pan i mean the pandemic or uh you mentioned black lives matter movement uh -huh. the movement in here as well but let's just talk about like surviving the pandemic from a what, what we might think of as a properly applied versus <laughs> improperly applied stoicism there's the suck it up and bear it all by yourself in your house trying to get by and then there's uh, a, a form that may uh, connect you with others uh, in a deeper way and, re and have you reaching out to others what what might that look like from a right that's great so i often thought of the frontline workers during the writing of this book who were reaching out to others all the time and they did have to deal with their own fear they were afraid of coming home and contaminating their family many spent their nights at the hospitals mm. they would come home and somehow bur if not burn their clothes figure out a way to undress and get their uh their garments into the washing machine before they even touch base with anyone um i thought of them a lot um i thought of some of the doctors um and frontline workers all the healthcare um staff who acted as proxy children parents of those who couldn't be there and had to figure out how to humanize the process for those who couldn't be there i read a lot in the papers we all did and it mm -hmm. moved me deeply i also thought and i thought they are being uh they're being stoic but in a way that supports the organization and community they're a part of as well as um, the healthcare system. I also thought that they often get a raw deal, um, that, that, that they're um, exposed more to the virus than I was, um, that they often didn't have the resources that I have. Um, um, they live close, you know, some of them lived closer to their family members than I do. And, you know, I mean, in, in a tight, in a tight, uh, housing situation. Mm -hmm. We know this. We, we know how inequitably um, the virus hit. It may be a free, you know, a virus that knows no borders, but it does know borders about who got hit and who was treated poorly. So I thought a lot about that. And I thought, you know, stoicism, some of the best parts of stoicism are about benevolence. That's Seneca. He writes a whole book on it, which I think is pretty amazing. Not often talked about, about the, um, the giving back and forth, the gratitude, and then the benefaction and the gratitude. I, I, you know, we talk a lot about gratitude this year, but it, you know, it was written about a lot. I mean, they had formalized versions of it because the Romans have all these decorous versions of everything. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that said, that's what they were talking about. So I was really thinking about benefaction um, and the and also the emotional expression. If you read Cicero or Seneca on this, they aren't just like, you know, give a cloak, give a book. Um, don't give a cloak, you know, to someone in the middle of the winter who needs it. Don't give a book to a country bumpkin. It's quite funny. <laughs> but they also talk about the face. Furrowed brows are like stones given to someone. Hmm. A smile is a gift. So it's not so it's not flat. Okay, who thinks of the Stoics as emotionally expressive promoters? But they are, you know, and that's the part that I was thinking about. I again, how to connect with others um, and what texts pull that out. Mm -hmm. I also was thinking a little bit about um, preparation. You know, they're big on preparation. Yeah. Um, if you rehearse in advance, you might have, uh, uh, not be surprised when the worst comes. That's so. Armor your arm yourself a wee bit for worst case scenarios, and and challenge yourself with worst case scenarios. Well, so that's essentially what infectious disease doctors do day in and day out. You're a biologist. You kind of know this. You, um, and in fact, messenger RNA was being developed in advance for other purposes mm -hmm. than the vaccine. So we didn't always take the message about prepare yourself early enough. So I had that in mind. And sometimes it caused some anger in my mind, I have mm. to say. And so I had to think about how to react to that anger and how I could take, could enlarge my sphere of responsibility while still protecting myself and so on. So 
Um, maybe one quick example that was always with me was this. Um, Seneca talks about an Epictetus, all of them talk about pre-rehearsing so you're not caught off guard um, and dwelling in the future that's you know um, imagining the future and um, about two years ago or so as I was thinking about stoicism my mom was still with us and um, she never wanted to think about death it was just um, not her thing <laughs> it was going to be her thing but it wasn't her thing <laughs> and so I had to I had to figure out how to talk about death with my mom uh, you know, in my two to three times a week visits into the nursing home. And at some point, I just said, you know, mom, I know you really like it here. It's really comfortable. But just remind me, did we sign up for the immortality plan? <laughs> because if we did, it's going to be really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so that became our joke of um, when we had to talk about hard things, we talked about the future in a kind of jocular way. Um, and it always was a little dance we had with each other back and forth, back and forth. So I, I think of that as a bit of a gift I gave to my mom about how to think about the future in a way that made it palatable and not something to be afraid of. Very stoic in some ways. Yeah, the stoics do use uh, reframing of, of things and and occasionally, little bits of humor. If you if, if you if you know how to read it, <laughs> you can you can be caught by surprise there. Um, you've mentioned Seneca a lot uh, already. Um, uh, you you mentioned him throughout the book as well. Uh, and before before I go there, let me just uh, I just wanted to point out for the listeners that you were talking about frontline workers and and uh, uh, James Stockdale, and you have these great little. Uh, sections throughout the book you talk about the ancients but then you'll bring up a biography of someone more recent and how um what you're talking about applies to their life so it, it's a it's a nice way to uh to, to to give uh modern examples of some of these ideas in in, in action and uh that was it's it's a good it's a good read and uh, i i want to go ahead and say that now before i forget thank you thank you so much Steve. um one thing that i've always had an issue with and, and I, I, I'm not a, you know, philosopher or, or a historian by any means, but um, so I know it's hard to drag someone from 2000 years ago and put them on trial and say, you don't live up to modern standards because that wouldn't be fair. But the, the, the fact that the Stoics never, at least in what the writings we have, never really say, and slavery's wrong, period. You know, we're all in the cosmopolis. We're all share the spark of reason. We uh, um, and you talk about Seneca discussing the treatment of others, but there's an ulterior motive there, uh, in, in uh, which I found interesting. Uh, would, would you would you talk to me about your thoughts on on Stoicism and and slavery and and Seneca's uh, descri descriptions of how we should treat our slaves? I just thought that was all pretty fascinating. Thanks. So yeah, you can't quite avoid the Stoics on the idea that, well, enslavement isn't out there, it's really just inside. Right. You know, because after all, Epictetus was enslaved, a Roman slave, and he found freedom, or he would say, I found freedom, by turning to the inner citadel. Okay, that said, Seneca's retinue of household enslaved would make Dalton Abbey look kind of shabby. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> they, were, they were all over. And he has, he's often been thought of as a, um, you know, a, 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 a humanist uh, insofar as he thinks about all of us as being enslaved. And so uh, there's, it, it's just a matter of fortune whether some are or some aren't. So don't get uppity about your freedom. You could be enslaved tomorrow. Okay. And then he also has a lot of passages in the letters about how you should treat your enslaved persons kindly as if they, you know, with compassion and gratitude. And so you have to wonder a little bit about where is it coming from? Um, and again, I'm, I sympathize. We, we, we can't read a culture as our own. I mean, we can learn from it, but we oughtn't to make the mistakes of it. It would be horrible mm -hmm. if we went back. 
I would not be a university professor. <laughs> um, you know, um, my children, my daughter and my son would not have equal opportunities to be educated. I would have been left on a rock to die because I was a premature child. So they would have just left me out to be exposed to the elements probably. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we, <laughs> you know, the barbarous bits of the past or the unenlightened bits, we, who wants to go there? That said, um, so the Stoics do seem a lot better than Aristotle because Aristotle mm. says we are by nature, some of us are by nature slaves. We just, mm. some, some don't have any reason or they're lacking in reason and its authority. But the Stoics don't say that. So they seem a lot better. That said, what they do do, however, is some of this is self-protection. It's self-defense. Fugitive enslaved persons is a big deal in Roman times. If you don't treat your, your enslaved well, they could run away. And if they run away, you have no one taking care of your vineyards, you have no one taking care of your books, your accounts, and you have no one you know, serving you meals or banquets. Seneca is really well aware of that. And you all, they also can bring you to court and they can tell how poorly you treated them, hmm. that you flogged them. Wow. So all of that um, is sort of on his mind, I think, because his audience is uh, the educated upper crust you know, that's at least initially to whom he's writing. And he wants to be sure they get that it's in their advantage to teach, uh, to treat their enslaved well. So it's a complicated story. It, it sort of reads, you're not a slave. I am enslaved, he says of himself. <laughs> no, you're not. I'm every bit as much enslaved as you are. And it kind of goes back and forth, ego, alter ego, but <laughs> it's got a little bit of an ulterior motive. Yeah, Seneca, like you said, is a, an interesting character. He working for the most nefarious, one of the most nefarious individuals of the time and standing up for him in many ways, but then trying to sneak out the back door at the same time, you know, later, like, I went out, I went out, I went out. And uh, yeah. And he doesn't get, you know, what goes around comes around. <laughs> yeah. At the, at the very end. Yeah. At he swims in very, very dirty waters. And that's part of it. He's fighting a lot of demons. Um, he definitely is fighting the demon of opulence. He's fighting the demon of power. He's fighting the demon of supporting a um, pretty nefarious emperor, as you say. And that, that to me, that to me uh, is what is somewhat endearing, I guess, about some of the Stoics in that they're they're not they're not deifiable if you know their faults. They they were people, and they had struggles just you know I, I don't have the same struggles as Seneca uh I don't have you know you don't work for Nero no no not <laughs> at the moment uh but and I don't have a, a large bank account I'm a, a, a university lecturer in Arkansas I mean come on but uh but but uh, uh you know some of the we all have those things we know we should be doing better at or we should change um and knowing that that Seneca who wrote so well about how the good life should be led, struggled to uh, walk that path from time to time. And that's, that's uh, right. Uh, so there, I find their exhortations to strive to be better, what's endearing in part, you know, they exhort us to aspire to strive. And that's always a good thing. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the other thing is that they exhort us to, um, to, um, realize that we're in the sick bed as well as occasionally give therapy. That's what Seneca right. says. I'm the doctor, but I'm, but, but you've entered a sick, a sick man's room. Something to that effect. <laughs> Absolutely. I've said that many times to my listeners. Just remember, I'm in the bed next to you here. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a lab coat on. I'm, I'm next to you in the sick bed. So I'm just trying to figure this out as we go. Uh, so there are something like, I think, nine chapters you have or so uh, in the text, uh, different themes. Um, one that I found surprising to see in there, be just based on how Stoicism is typically presented, uh, was the chapter on healing through self-compassion. Yeah. Um, and you told a very, it's a story that I can relate to, but I uh, obviously can't. Uh, I can relate to it in minor things I've done, decisions I've made that I regret and wish I had changed. You talk about, uh, I believe it's in this chapter, uh, Lane McDowell. A fighter pilot, Navy fighter mm -hmm. pilot. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, 
uh, his his story, and I could see that really. Uh, I, I I don't want to. I'll let you if you want to talk about it. You can, sure. or you can tease him into buying your book by. Uh, not I'll tease you into. Yeah, I'll tease you into buying the book. But it's essentially <laughs> a, a really moving story about a fighter pilot who um, did something that he probably isn't really culpable for, maybe. Um, but um, he pounded hard on himself. And um, I try to, I've, much of my career, um, I've thought about moral injury. And by that, I mean the sense of shattered moral identity by having done something you think is or, or you think is um, a transgression or having suffered it or you think you suffered a transgression or having witnessed it up close. Um, you could think of all sorts of the ways in which we suffer it, not just in the military, but in life itself and, uh, and lesser and more. And in this case, I think he suffered it really hard. Mm -hmm. And um, I bring to bear, and readers will have to find out, I don't want, spoiler alert, you know, <laughs> I bring to bear a wonderful play of Seneca's to help us understand the idea that the Stoics may leave room for self-compassion. It's not what you typically think. But. Right, right, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's great. And yeah, so it's, it's a part of Stoic wisdom, I think, self-compassion. Well, while I have you here, since you are a, a, a scholar of Aristotle, <laughs> um, uh, and and you mentioned you mentioned it throughout a little bit, but what are some of the the uh, uh, teachings of Aristotle that the Stoics really picked up on and either used or refuted? Like what what do you see? What how, how much of Aristotle do you see running through uh, the Stoic texts? Well, the Stoics. Uh, we're, we're given, handed a problem. The problem they were handed by Aristotle was what should we do with external goods in our lives? They can destabilize our sense of flourishing. Eudaimonia is the Greek and it means poorly happiness, but you know, thriving flourishing because it, tragedy strikes. I mean, these are Greeks. They read their Greek, know their Greek tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the Stoics also, uh, the Roman Stoics especially, but the, uh, the uh, ancient Greek ones are living in, you know, times warfare that lasts forever and um, living also with um, lots and lots of pestilence. They had their own plagues, the Antonine Plague. Uh, and so they really want to think about how do you hold on to your uh, happiness if it's so easily derailed? Aristotle says you got to stick in some prosperity. Eudaimonia sort of literally means a little bit of prosperity, good, a bit of good luck. And so you got to stick some in. You got to have good friends. Your children can't predecease you. Can't be too ugly. Have to have some wealth. Have to live in a good city. You know, not be in a prisoner. And the list goes on. The Stoics say, whoa, that's a lot of dependence on the outside world. I'll call all the external goods indifference. That's their um, term of art. And it's a big one. They draw really bright stripes in order to solve a problem inherited from Aristotle. If we think of them indifference, we won't put, they won't make a difference to our happiness. Keep them outside happiness or eudaimonia. They're still goods, but they're not genuine goods. So they have a subordinated status. And your wisdom is to select them wisely in all the circumstances of life that present themselves. Sometimes disease might be better than health if being healthy means you have to serve a tyrant. Sometimes health is better than disease if you can be beneficent or be a hospital worker and your health allows you to carry on. Kind of goes like that. Mm -hmm. That's a big mm -hmm. problem. And sometimes they get into, I would say, bad places <laughs> or over-exaggerated places in holding a line they shouldn't hold as tightly sometimes. But they're reacting to Aristotle. Okay. Because he was messy. Aristotle always says in Greek, it's a little, on the one hand this, and on the other hand that. Hamen, ha death. That's how it goes in Greek. And the Stoics want bright stripes. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the path right there. Go the, yeah. <laughs> Interesting, but what's I, I I liked how you said in the book, uh, you know, the the Stoics weren't necessarily indifferent to indifference. Those are you know they're they quite, are the, quite different. They are different. 
uh, indifference is different from indifference with the TS and they, and it does make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> So we should make them, a poem out of this. <laughs> yeah, to keep them to keep them separate. Yes, but I think it's very easy to overstate um, stoicism, and also I think what I really worry about it's not just self. You know, I really make the case I think in Stoic wisdom that resilience isn't just self journey. It's not. I can't even imagine what self journey is like if it does. If it's not about being a good soul in this world mm -hmm. doing good for others self journey isn't narcissism i mean there's nothing in the greek world about that that is not at all greek hmm. or really roman to just be well, preoccupied I, I, with yourself i love how this book is coming out uh, and at the uh, same time uh uh I just had Kai Whiting on the podcast. I don't know if you've ever met Kai. Uh, he has a book out um, with similar themes about the uh, the the uh, live it, living as part of the cosmopolis rather than uh, a, a, an individual's journey. You know, so it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's it's nice to see that coming forth from multiple sources. Um, it's 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 good to see. So your your new book. Um, it is, as we said, Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. So before we go, that, and a lovely sure. cover, by the way. Thank um, you. Yeah, Oxford did a great job. So do you have anything to say just for those listening? Um, how can Stoicism help to uh, help us to achieve resilience in the modern in the modern era in a way that's not toxic? <laughs> great. I think it's got lots of ways that we can build healthy psychological habits from the bottom up about putting some space between our real quick impressions or our uh, narrow-mindedness so that when we uh, see the world, we see it in slightly more expansive or generous ways and that they really think that that education, that maybe we could say, um, thinking a bit more slowly, to use Daniel Kahneman's term, when we think too fast, again, a Kahneman term, is, is what they were after. They were very prescient. So thinking slowly when we react really fast, both in having certain emotions and seeing the world in certain ways, and then also act on those emotions and impressions. That's, I think, their gift. It's very psychological in a sense of building the world up from how they best understood our psyches and then creating community through enlightened psyches in a certain way. So that, that's what I would say in nine easy lessons. Nine easy. Now where can we find this book? You can find it in any bookstore that is your favorite. It may not yet, it, it should be there. It, it's certainly off the printing press, off Gutenberg's press. <laughs> and, um, I've signed copies in my DC bookstore just yesterday or a few days ago. Um, Amazon has it. So whatever is your favorite. If it says pre-order, pre-order, but you'll get it almost immediately. Excellent. Well, I, uh, I invite everyone to check this, this work out. It's a great, uh, great book and a great uh, look at a side of stoicism that is easily overlooked that, that I think if you want to be a stoic and not just a life hacker uh, and have a whole picture it's it's uh something we need to think about it and and uh work on building that cosmopolis the, those relationships with others i would say just one thing steve i am wearing a for those of you that are watching i am wearing a floral shirt in homage to the botanist that you thank are. you very much that's <laughs> very kind of you i feel connected already right <laughs> <laughs> well uh check it out it's um uh, uh, Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nancy Sherman, for joining the Sunday Stoic Podcast. Thank you so much, Steve. And it's as been I a end pleasure. It, thank you very much. It's been, uh, me as well. I really enjoyed it. And as I end every episode, uh, carpe diem. Indeed. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to The Sunday Stoic. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review The Sunday Stoic on iTunes. 
Become a member of the Sunday Stoic team, earn rewards, and be an integral part of the show by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash sundaystoic. Contact the show by emailing sundaystoic at gmail.com or by leaving a voicemail at 501-503-3132. To find out more, visit www.sundaystoicpodcast.com. And as Steve always says, carpe diem. <laughs>